We're about to meet three very different men. James Gosling is one of them. Now, Gosling might look like just another of those bearded, balding, bespectacled Canadian computer geeks, and he'll tell you privately that's exactly what he is. What he won't tell you is that he's been hailed as the best computer geek in the world. We're also going to meet Jim Clark, who may be one of the smartest businessmen in the world, for in one working day on Wall Street, he's reputed to have made, personally, about a hundred million dollars an hour. You'd be smiling too if you made that much money. And Bob Kahn, without doubt, is one of the major pioneers of our time, the co-inventor of the technology that let computers talk to each other, and in doing so, changed the lives of Gosling and Clark and the rest of us. They each have doctorates in computer science, each spend their working hours dealing with ideas and concepts, and with three totally different approaches, they are, each of them, changing the future of life on the internet. I get a real kick out of sort of showing something to somebody and they just go, wow. There's, there's, there, there are very few bigger thrills than just a wow from somebody else. Watch this very carefully, for if you've been on the World Wide Web in the last little while, you'll see much more than just a couple of animated cats making noise. For this is the equivalent of the day motion pictures got sound, the day color came to television the day you had your first real date. The web, since its inception, has been made up of static information. You could look and read, but what came up on your computer screen was not truly interactive. You couldn't get in and manipulate the material. James Gosling has changed all that. You get different drums. Of course, it's the grunts that I like the best. It's really simple. Gosling has created a new computer language called Java, where among other things you can now make animated cats grunt and play along with various other musical instruments. Yeah, if one actually had some talent, um, which isn't me. He does, of course, have an immense talent. Yes. In fact, when some Silicon Valley big shot said that Gosling was perhaps the world's greatest living programmer, his friends had the quote printed on his business cards. James Gosling refused to hand them out, even to the admirers who call him a god of programming. I don't think I'm particularly a god of programmers. Um, I think I'm probably I'm a pretty good programmer. I wouldn't consider myself godlike. Um, there are several godlike programmers out there, people that I think are pretty godlike. Um, but I think what I do the best is is, 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 is is sort of getting off the beaten track. In internet development, James Gosling's new creation from off the beaten track is as important as a hearing aid would have been to Beethoven or radar to Christopher Columbus. And the ways we'll use Java-inspired sites appear endless. If you live, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, one day this might come in handy. Subway lines in the, in the Bay Area. You can see all the stations here going through, through East Oakland and back out across the Bay Bridge here. There's, there's one crossing the bridge and one going down the um, financial district in San Francisco, heading out under the bay. Imagine that you've, that, that, that you've got like a little, a little handheld and you're sort of walking down the street and you're wondering, gee, you know, can I catch the BART? And so you can get this, get this map up on your screen that's got the data now for where the trains are and if you know where you are and you're thinking about which station to go to. I mean, not only is this a, a train schedule, but it it's tells you what's going on in the, in the real world with you know, where, all the, where all the trains are and lets you relate it to where you're actually sitting. He claims he gets a lot of his ideas by just going for a walk, but in what has become one of the legends of the internet, he came up with part of the concept for Java, believe it or not, at a Doobie Brothers concert. I was sitting there in my seat sort of staring up at the lights and it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I had all these ideas about networking and inter interconnecting things, just like watching the wires in the, in, the, in the lights and watching the sort of robo cameras that they had controlling the system. Um, and, and so these, these, these ideas, you know, and the, these things sort of percolating in your, in your head, they sort of take over your life. 
And I mean, my wife is is just always mad at me or or annoyed because I'm always like really um, really spacey. You know, it, it it doesn't matter where I am. I can be driving down the road, and 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 the the, the whole idea factory is just going going nuts. And every now and then, she says, "James, pull off, pull off the road. I'm driving." Um, cause I just, I'm just not paying attention and, and, you know, the ideas just come from God knows where. Born and educated in Calgary, Gosling took his PhD at Carnegie Mellon with a doctoral thesis entitled, The Manipulation of Algebraic Constraints. You figure it out. Over the last 15 years or so, he's become something of a programming legend. He's a vice president and fellow at Sun Microsystems, yet a geek among geeks. James Gosling has managed to stay in touch with the rest of us by seeing the net less as a giant experiment and more as another consumer device, which to survive will need to be as stable, simple, and useful as his mom's toaster. Um, you know, pieces of software live for like a year or two and then they're, you know, roadkill. In the consumer business, they're, you know, my, my mom's got this, to this toaster that's like 42 years old. It's a great toaster, works just fine. Nobody's changed the, 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 the wall plug. Nobody's you know, really dramatically changed the shape of a slice of bread. And so all the interfaces that this toaster understands um, are, have been stable. And, 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 and that kind of stability of interfaces is completely unheard of in the, in the, in the software business. So one of the things that went into Java really early on is a set of facilities for not only you know making interfaces between components really explicit, but but dealing with um, how they evolve so that old things can talk to new things. Part of the fallout of James Gosling's creation is that it could eventually free us from having to buy expensive smart computers and costly software. Because why would we need to spend a fortune and a lot of bells and whistles on one machine when we could simply go to the net and download each bell and each whistle as we needed them? Why buy a bus to go downtown when all you really need is a ticket. It's the simple originality and practicality of the concept that are Gosling's trademarks. The test for me is is trying to like explain it to my mom in 25 words or less. And just what 25 words or less would James Gosling use to describe Java to his mom? How would he explain the architecture he's created? Architecture that is changing the very nature of the World Wide Web. We're waiting, James. It's like opening up a book and instead of seeing pictures that just sit there, the pictures are alive. And you can actually interact with the pictures and you can talk to the pictures. And the pictures can be connected to something out there. Um, and then I'd show her. In the computer business, an entire generation, they say, lasts about three years. But it's taken only a third of that for one company to go from rented offices in this building to owning this building and this one and this one. Plus offices in London, Paris, Munich and Tokyo. Which might explain that smile on the face of Chairman Jim Clark, clearly enjoying life on the internet. If you read the business magazines, you might have heard of Jim Clark. He was an associate professor at Stanford who left in 1982 to found a company called Silicon Graphics. Last year it had revenues of about a billion and a half dollars. But in 1994, Jim Clark quit as chairman of Silicon Graphics to set up another company called Netscape, which had investors pining and panting and putting up two billion dollars within days of it going public. The Netscape ride has been phenomenal. We, uh, uh, I, I knew it was going to happen. I could, I could see it, maybe not. You, you never see exactly how it's going to unfold, but I knew it was going to be a, an important thing, that what we were doing was really important, and that it was going to be big. You're in the middle of a tornado, and frankly, it's a phenomenon associated with how companies either engage the market or they don't. They either become the leader or they don't. And, and we're in it and we gotta hold on because the tornado is a fast moving thing. The tornado that is the World Wide Web has been fueled by the software that is Netscape. 
It is one of the most mutually beneficial convergences in modern business life. When Netscape flooded the net with free software in 1994, they had Silicon Valley shaking its head in disbelief. But in retrospect, it was a brilliant corporate strategy because as hundreds of thousands of ordinary people downloaded it without charge, companies that wanted to reach all those people had to buy the commercial version of the software. And Netscape, because it was easy to use and was free, became the first browser of choice for three out of four in the internet population. It also became, essentially, the industry standard for using the web. And Jim Clark became an industry standard in how to turn an idea into a $2 billion business. It's, um, it's like any other company. You just always have to be inventive and afraid of the competition. You know, the, the moment you become complacent and thinking you've solved it all is just the moment when you're going to be surprised and someone's going to come out of nowhere and take your market away. Um, my philosophy is building companies that create markets, not inventing companies that go out and see a big market to capture from someone else. And, you know, that's what I did at Silicon Graphics, what we're doing here. And we become very, very defensive and protective of the markets we create. We don't want someone else to steal them from us. So we, we uh, almost become paranoid about that. Clark's instincts for success have made him one of the leading thinkers and innovators in the business of the Internet. He's acutely conscious of where it fits in in the bigger picture and where we are now. We'll, we'll think of this period as a, as a dramatic transformation period for telecommunications. What's really occurring in my assessment with the World Wide Web and more, more globally the Internet, because the web, bear in mind the World Wide Web is just a publishing protocol, a demand media retrieval protocol. Uh, you've got FTP for moving programs around and you have uh, email protocols for shipping messages around. You can have telephone running on the World Wide Web, uh, on, the, uh, on the Internet, and you're going to have uh, video conferencing. So what, what we're seeing right now occurring is a transformation from a predominantly voice-oriented telecommunications system to a data-oriented telecommunications system. That's what the Internet is. It's just a data telecommunications system. And as a result of that, um, I mean, think about there's there's at least two trillion dollars worth of economy in the world devoted to to um, to voice communications and telecommunications. Probably much larger than that, but it's at least that. That entire industry is going to make a shift in the next ten years. The first milestone has actually occurred, and that is the the, the introduction of the web itself and making it easy to to access by a wide variety of people. I think all consumer devices televisions, telephones, essentially the ordinary home computer devices that you think of today as having a special connection of one form or another will all connect into your data communications concentrator, which will be your PC. And that PC will manage your retrieval of television programming or educational material or computer software or checking your bank account. Uh, retrieving anything else, any other kind of information from the web, doing telephone. I mean, this, this is what I believe. It's going to be essentially your communications resource and all of these other things that you currently use as independent things, telephone system, cable television system, are all going to become one conduit and, and the content going over that conduit will be what your PC manages, your personal computer manages. So Jim Clark predicts that the internet will evolve as the new backbone for all our communication needs. It'll be our computer access, our telephone, television, automatic bank teller, and just about anything else we can think of, all rolled into one. And now that Netscape and Sun Microsystems have been into a long-term business relationship with Java, this is the way we'll get our newspapers. So this is the, the Raleigh, North Carolina News and Observer. And uh, it's a, just just a newspaper, but they've 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 sort of spiced it up with a with a number of things. One is they've got this this sort of scrolling piece of text that tells you what all the top stories are. Um, congressional documents missing, a subpoena likely, British top story. Up here, there's there's a series of images of the you know, late breaking news, and it's sort of continuously updating all these little all these little image clips. Um, to show you sort of what's hot in each of in each of these different categories. Next step will be video, and then will be true full motion video on demand. So in ten years' time, I am absolutely confident 
that the internet will be carrying will be the information highway that we've all been talking about for the last five seven years it will be the mechanism for delivering all of this uh, to the ordinary consumer Clark's predictions for the net are taken seriously in Silicon Valley and in Wall Street after all this is the same Jim Clark who put Netscape on the stock market one day in 1995 and is reputed to have earned personally nearly 600 million dollars in the few hours the market was open it, it's been consistent with what I expected but it's a little bit of a surprise even at that yeah a simple way to interconnect computers and to form such a network if you're interested at all in the history of communications this is an important piece of film for this is computer scientist Robert Kahn explaining in 1972 how something called the internet was going to work each of the computers to each other to form a fully connected network this explanation of the technical breakthrough didn't make any of the business pages at the time Wall Street didn't notice the venture capitalists didn't rush to throw money at Bob Kahn but this moment is to the internet what the moon landing was to space travel this was the first giant step for mankind in cyberspace. Dr. Kahn, with computer scientist and colleague Vince Cerf, invented the first internet protocols, the standards that let different computers actually talk to each other. It was that breakthrough that made the whole thing possible. And while the blackboards have changed considerably since then, the basic concept of interconnected computers has remained much the same. Oh, I knew the idea was extremely powerful, you know, when I first had it. Um, what I didn't know was, one, how practical it would turn out to be in terms of real implementation. What I didn't know was how, um, how much potential there might be in actually getting other people to buy into this general notion. And of course, when we started it, you have to recall, there was no notion of a local area net as we know it today. There was no notion of the gateway, in fact, or router. That was something we invented as part of that plan, there was no uh, cost-effective uh, form of computing around for the individual. I mean, the PC and workstation had not yet really been invented. This was, I think, perhaps still a gleam in the, eye, in the eyes of the folks at Xerox Park uh, and others. Um, so, I mean, many other things had to happen technologically before this thing could possibly have been as large and as impactful a development as we've now seen it become. Bob Kahn is now president of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, based outside Washington, D.C. Here they hope to lead the development of computer network research into the next stage, when the number of people using computers soars even higher than some of the pundits are now predicting. If the personal computers get inexpensive enough, and I suspect they will, then I think the penetration will, will go up dramatically. Whether it gets to the 90 percentile mark where the telephones have got, who knows? Certainly a real good chance in my view that that could happen because the fact this technology is so powerful there may be no need for all of these other conveyances. It can all be done and controlled and monitored through one central box that doesn't cost much and it's got all this incredible power. Um, it might even be the case that just like you know a typical home today comes with electricity when it's built that sort of not something you decide, shall I put electricity in the house or not? It, it sort of comes wired, it's connected up to a, you know, a local uh, infrastructure for water and sewer if it's there, almost always. It's not something you choose to do. It may very well be that a network connection like this turns out to be something that every home gets wired for and what you pay for is the actual usage that you make of it. The net has come a long way since Bob Kahn explained it for posterity in an old blackboard and no one back in 1972 had any idea how far it would actually travel that we'd go from this to this Jim Gosling's Java will now permit doctors to probe CAT scans on the web downloading CAT scans and medical information from thousands of miles away is not new but being able to manipulate them in this way is I mean this, this particular CAT scan application here is one where you get like a you can do a slice through the body here and then look at slices here and you can sort of go up and down you know, five years from now, you'll be able to take it, spin it around, strip off the layers. People have done all kinds of demos that look like that. They require like a hundred thousand dollar machine just to get started. Um, you should be able to do that at home. A lot of people have been doing, you know, cool stuff with you know mounting cameras on on places, and you can just sort of go and look at them. 
those are just going to get better. Um, you'll be able to sort of virtually roam the world and, 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 and see, you know, what the hell the, the, the weather like on the beach in Thailand. Um, and you'll be able to see the beach in Thailand now. There seems little doubt that as the net grows in popularity, it will also grow in practical usefulness, becoming eventually a ubiquitous fixture in our normal everyday lives. But the one major restriction to this happening is the speed of the bandwidth. For right now, there are times when waiting for a page to appear can seem interminable, even to the world's greatest programmer. Waiting for Godot. The bandwidth is simply a measurement of how much information can be transmitted in any given period of time. Right now, we're on the equivalent of an unpaved country road, and what we'll need is a 10-lane freeway. It's the bandwidth connection speed that will have to get a great deal faster if we're to grasp the full consumer potential of the internet. And Jim Clark is leading the charge to convince the communications industry to accept the inevitable. We have a, a huge built-in inertia in our telecommunications infrastructure. It's been the same way for many, many years. What's happened in the last 20 years, or maybe especially the last 10 years, is a lot of the telecommunications infrastructure has, has been re replaced with fiber optics. But fiber optics gives you such a huge capacity that we're not utilizing the vast majority of it. And yet voice rates, voice tariff rates for ordinary telephone conversations re continue to remain high and these, these phone companies don't seem to have the motivation to bring the prices down and offer data services. So my biggest concern is getting them to see that this is an important thing for their future and that they do it because the future is going to switch to data very quickly. I'm trying to stimulate it to occur more rapidly but I'm absolutely convinced it will occur, and those telecom companies that see that first will in fact prosper more. As Jim Clark can testify, there are fortunes to be made by grasping and even creating the direction for the future of the internet. But it is James Gosling who might have the key to what all that will really mean to most of us. You know, lot, lot, lots of folks are working on, on like, like, like little handheld computers that are, that are not really computers themselves, but they're more just like um, access portals into the web and and so the thing that you think of as your personal computer may not really even exist it may it, you know your, your personal computer might be something that you have on your desk at home or at work but you may actually never even use it you know physically you know why do you need to touch it when you can get at it from wherever you are um, you know from whatever sort of access device is, is around you know whether it's something in a car something that's handheld um, you know, like, like cellular telephones. Um, lots of folks are starting to build cell cellular telephones that have more than enough guts in them to, 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 to make them, you know, web browsers. Um, you know, so that, you know, you enter all the right passwords in bingo, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, both search somebody's database of Chinese restaurants and you're able to sort of get into your, your, your house system and start, you know, you know, turning on the hot tub or, or you know, doing, doing your monthly bills. So it seems we are, all of us, heading towards a time when the internet won't be something we still marvel at or worry over or grapple with or even make TV shows about. Like electricity or television or the phone or your relatives, it will simply be there. A generation from now, what James Gosling and Jim Clark and Bob Kahn and thousands of others will have orchestrated is a technology which will become invisible. Yet it will be a technology and a culture to which we'll be tied irretrievably, utterly, and everlastingly. And we won't even notice we're living life on the Internet. If you've access to the World Wide Web, we've prepared a site for you. This is the address. We look forward to hearing from you. Till next time, goodbye. <laughs>